Good afternoon. My name is uh, Friso, and I have a problem because I have 20 slides and I have 20 minutes, and one of the slides actually is going to take me at least two minutes. So um, we'll have to get moving. I'm here to talk to you about networks, and uh, one of the first things is I'd like to talk about why networks matter. What is the point in having them anyway? Um, as an example, let's say you're trying to organize a conference, and uh, one of the natural things you do then is look out on Twitter for people mentioning your conference. Because they matter to you because, well, uh, they might come to your conference or might be interested in your conference, and then you could somehow try to approach those people. This is my friend, my friend Chris. Um, he is uh, shouting to the world that he booked his ticket for Berlin Buzzwords, which is awesome. Um, so probably he's here. Hi, Chris. Now, this piece of information, just as it is, it doesn't mean that much other than that Chris is coming, which is good, but I don't have to approach him because he will already be there. So what I probably would be interested in is what is surrounding Chris and who are those people and will, those be, they, will they be potentially interesting to me? So if we make a network out of that, and we add some relations to other entities in the world, then we can see things like, you know, maybe Chris was retweeted a couple of times. Um, Chris also follows a particular person by the handle of FZK. Uh, also, there's this other guy who also follows me. Um, this becomes a network of things. So I can say, okay, give me all the people who follow Chris. And maybe also all the people who are followed by Chris and who is a, whoever is connected to that. This is a start, but this is maybe not yet why it really becomes interesting. So if we look at the person up right there, he um, won a pair of, uh, or a free ticket to the GoTo conference in Amsterdam, and he is thanking me for uh, the fact that I arranged that for him, which is not really true because Tengen sponsored does. You also see a hashtag over there. Um, that hashtag is the official hashtag to a uh, user group that we have in the Netherlands. It's the Netherlands Hadoop user group. So what you have now is like a network that says, Chris is this guy, he follows this other guy, there's this other guy following him as well, and he also goes to this meetup every now and then. Um, right now, this is potentially interesting, because if I am organizing my conference and I want to reach out to people saying, hey, um, there's a group of people and I'd like to you know, interest them to the same conference that Chris is probably interested in because he's going there. Um, I can just you know, have this network database and just ask the question, give me all the people surrounding Chris that may be interested in my conference as well. But then you have the problem there. Who are the people that may be interested in my conference as well? So what I also need in my network is to have features. I need you know, specific properties on each person or each entity in that network that says, okay, this is a person that goes to meetup group X. Um, this is a person mainly tweeting about tech subjects. Because then I can say, give me all the people surrounding Chris who go to meetups and tweet about tech subjects. And that's interesting, because then I go to those meetup groups and say, hey, I have this discount code. Could you promote my conference? Now, that's the kind of database that makes networks interesting. And the ability to do, to do those kinds of queries against networks is actually quite powerful. In this example, you could quite easily you know, figure out a group of people that you need to approach, and also the ways in which you can approach them. But the important thing here is that we have to add these features. And let's say I have this network database, and I put all the information in there. Um, I couldn't possibly put all the tweets that people ever shouted to the world in there because it becomes large quite rapidly. So what I probably want to do is take all the raw data that I have and do this feature extraction, whether it's really simple things like, you know, just the domains that, uh, that are in the links that people tweet about, um, which could be meetup.com, um, or even simple counts, or the fact that they have ever retweeted something. Um, put all that. I mean, take all that raw data, extract the features, and put that into my network database. And then I can have queries that give me you know, instant results in real time about things that I'd like to know about the world. 
Now, uh, for the past six months or so, I've been working in financial services, and there they have a lot of interesting networks as well. And they don't generally allow me to talk about those, which is a pity because it's lots of fun. Um, what I can talk about and what I will do and try here today is uh, look at the tools and the different uh, te technologies that we use to work with these networks and to look at them and also to work together with domain experts because that's really important. Because once you, you've built your network, um, it will potentially look like this, which is interesting for a while because it's a pretty picture if you like these kind of pictures, but it doesn't really mean anything to you. Now, within this network, there are potentially interesting situations, right? Every single thing that, as a domain expert, interests you will be in there, because it's the full network. Um, but the problem is that, in various occasions, this domain can be really complex. In the Twitter example, we probably all have some kind of idea of what it means that somebody follows somebody else. But, for example, in the financial networks, I don't always know what it means that a single person holds five accounts and three offshore ones and this and that and that. I have no clue. Hmm? So uh, in order to do meaningful feature extraction and in order to you know, dig up the meaningful situations and the patterns in those networks, I need to work together with somebody who knows that domain really well. Um, in order to, that, to do that, we built a little tool that allows, to, allows us to easily you know, go through those networks. Um, I'll show you how it's done, and I'll show you based on a simple toy problem. Uh, we have a network, um, it's called the Internet, and it consists of a lot of separate networks, and there's people measuring the Internet, so they collect a lot of data, and the data looks like these lines here, and you see the red numbers over there, those are network numbers, and that means that somewhere on the Internet there exists a path a way to route traffic from A to B over those entities, those four separate networks. So take this in mind, and then we have a lot of those measurement points. You can actually draw a map of the logical connections in the internet. That map is actually this. Interesting. The really big one in the middle there is Akamai, I think, the content. Uh, uh, content delivery service. So now what we do is this. We take the raw data, um, we transform it into a very basic text file with nodes in one and edges in the other one, um, possibly do some enrichments on top of that. Um, then we take these text files and import them into Neo4j, which is a graph database. Um, it's made for storing and querying graphs, which lets you do interesting things. And then on top of Neo4j, we built this browser-based visualization and querying tool, which let us, lets us interact with the graph that we have. Doing pretty well on time. So the transformation initially from the raw data into a file that contains only the unique nodes and the unique edges that exist in this network is something that we do in Hadoop. The raw data is potentially large, and we need to just you know, grab the basic stuff out of there. So. Um, that's a very, very often a, a Hadoop skill problem for us. We don't like writing MapReduce jobs. Um, I don't think anybody really does like writing MapReduce jobs in Java with the basic API. Does any? You do? OK. Well, we use cascading as um, a, a higher level of abstraction. Uh, who of you know about cascading? That's quite a fair number. Just a, a quick summary what cascading does. It sits as an abstraction on top of Hadoop MapReduce, or the Java-based ver uh, version. And it lets you uh, think about your data in terms of records. So everything is a tuple of some number of fields. And then in cascading, you define a flow, which basically says, take this input, or maybe take these inputs, a number of them. Um, join together and do an uh, operation on each uh, individual record and then group by something and then do an operation on each of every of the groups and in the end push out this result. So that's exactly what we do here. Um, this is uh, the job for our toy problem. Take the internet measurement data, produce nodes and edges. 
On top, there's just this one file going in. Take two, uh, split the flow in two. That actually means we're going to process the input twice. One job that takes out all the nodes, just the unique network numbers that exist. The other job that takes out all the unique combinations of two network numbers. That's good, because it produces a file of nodes and edges. <laughs> now, if you have a really big network, that could still be problematic, because, well, if it doesn't fit in memory on a single machine, it probably won't make a very fast database. So you could try and do some magic there and eh, trim it down or do compression or a really compact representation of some things. But what we typically do is basically just take the whole graph and say we want to look at these kinds of things. So we just partition the graph in a number of pieces. And we look at one piece at a time. The graph partitioning is not something that will fit within the 20 minutes. So um, Later, when you can see the slides, you can actually click the links, and there's two blog posts about how you do that in cascading. So we do MapReduce-based uh, partitioning of the graphs. Then what you end up with, initially, is just this list of nodes and the list of edges. And what I have here is the list of nodes and the list of edges with some enrichment. So for example, I have this file, text file, uh, that has for each network number that exists the full name of that network. Now, the nice thing about Neo4j is that you can use these properties and actually index them. So I can you know, go into my network tool and say, give me all the networks that have this or this in the name. Now, in practice, the enrichments, we use a whole bunch of stuff for that. So we do some HAUT-based uh, jobs for feature extraction and uh, some classification uh, on top of that. So we classify individual transactions um, in, the, in the banking world. Um, there's also just some basic counts and other aggregates. And typically, when we have those results and we want to merge them back together with the nodes and edges file, we just load everything into Hive and do the joins. I heard earlier today on Twitter that's a 1970s approach. So I consider that proven technology. OK, so here's the Neo4j part, which is interesting. Um, Neo4j has an API that allows you to do batch importing of a graph. So that basically mean, means um, you have a non-transactional engine that allows you to build uh, a graph database from scratch in one go. Um, it's relatively fast, and it's very easy to use. There's these three uh, types. Uh, that are the main entry point to the API, the batch inserter, the batch inserter index provider, and then a batch inserter index, which comes out of the index provider. I can say create a node. It will return the ID of the node that was just created. Create another node, which also will return an ID. Also add some of the properties to the index, and then create a relationship between the two. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that if you create a bunch of nodes, several million, for example, then you need to hang on to the, all the ideas in memory because you need them later to create the relationships. You can also just flush everything and read the ideas back from the indexes that you just created, um, but that will take a lot more time to run your import job. In the end, you flush, you shut down, you shut down the database, and you have a database file. And when you have that, you can fire up Neo4j. It comes as a server component with that database underneath, and it will start serving your queries. We'll be looking at some of those. This is a uh, one-off benchmark. It can do this. So that's the volume you can think about. Do that in less than 30 minutes, given that everything fits in memory, and you'll have a database file after you run your import. So that's nice. Then we have a query language. Um, it lets you do things like this. Uh, it was developed by the Neo4j guys, and uh, they built it into their product. And you can say things like, okay, this is very basic. Give me all the relationships of a particular node that I look up by index. So the name is an index lookup there. And give her everything that's attached to it. Um, both nodes and edges can have properties, and you can put predicates on, on everything that's in there. So this is something that we actually quite often use is say, OK, give me uh, every relationship going out from this particular node where any of the values in an array property is greater than something. So in finance, that basically means give me, any, uh, give me the person that ever paid more than 500 euros to this other person. Um, so that's, that's relatively powerful. 
Um, you can have more interesting predicates on relationships. Relationships have different types. So I can say I want only the follows relationships. And I can actually query for whole paths, not just direct relationships. I can just say, give me anything that goes from this person to that person with a maximum length of five, and it will give you that. There's also shortest path calculations in there, um, which can also come in handy every now and then. Also, when you do relationship predicates, you can uh, add direction. So this is basically uh, uh, A has incoming relationship follows from X, and B has incoming relationship follows also from X. So that basically means give me all the people that follow both of these two. This is relatively powerful because it gives you um, insight into your graph structure pretty quickly because you can just query and see that happening. Now, when we work with the domain experts on the graph and we want to see actually interesting things, um, we want to know about you know, what is interesting to you and what does it mean so we can you know, grab that instance of an interesting problem and write a similarity search that gives me all the instances of that same uh, situation, then probably it helps to make something visual out of that. Um, there's this uh, JavaScript uh, visualization toolkit. It sits at thejit.org. I'm not sure what the official name is, but this is what it says on the website. There's many more. We like this one, several reasons. And what we have is this very trivial piece of uh, HTML and JavaScript code that allows us to work with the database by entering the cipher commands in there and then seeing that immediate visualization. It just falls off on the left a little bit. But this is, um, yeah, this is an index query for two different uh, nodes, two different networks on the internet. And I'll just say, give me the shortest path with a maximum length of 15, and then show me that. And if you were, you can do you know, basic things like move stuff around and panning and zooming. And each node has this number of buttons. And one of them is the plus that says expand that. And it will fill out the query there that says, OK, uh, you add that. So what we do in the browser is we keep this in-memory model of everything that you have in that particular view. And when you add new queries, you don't lose what's already there, but we, we merge in the results that came out of the database in the thing that you already have. Um, <clears throat> when you make this rich and when you actually have interesting features on all your nodes and edges and you have different symbols in the, in the nodes and different line widths and line colors for the edges to add a little bit of meaning, then this is a really interesting tool for working with domain experts and showing what is happening in the network and they can potentially identify situations that you never thought of before. I'm going to just let this run for a bit, but I think the basic idea is pretty clear. You get to do queries against the database and immediately visualize what it is that you're querying for. OK. Um, that was almost 20 minutes. So. We're almost done here. Um, the source code to the toy problem cascading job for importing and also for graph partitioning is on GitHub. The source code for the HTML viewer is also on GitHub. You can grab that. Neo4j is open source. You can just download that. And um, you can have fun with the same stuff we do, but without the banking data. Thank you. So, are there any questions to the speaker? Okay. Uh, you said if uh, you meet some requirements, everything fits in memory, and you can do operations in 30 minutes, basically. What happens when you don't fit in those requirements? How does it break down? Uh, well, Neo4j as a database doesn't currently. I think the guys are working on some kind of you know, uh, sharding slash distribution scheme, uh, which is a hard problem in graphs. Um, Neo4j currently does it. So basically, when you hit that memory boundary, you'll start swapping like an idiot. That, that's, that's what happens. Other questions? Make a run for it. There's 22 seconds left. 
Um, can you do the uh, import into the Neo4j database on your Hadoop cluster, or is that like a program that has to run afterwards? So it, it's a sequential job. So um, we we grab the data out of Hadoop and just stream it into this uh, importer that will um, use the Neo4j API to build that database. It's a single machine thing. So um, which is why it can run without transactioning. Okay. Then thanks again. Thank you. <laughs>